Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of r slash regular revenge. In today's episode. Beep, beep. Under the bus you go. Justice finally served on toxic former employers. Before we get started make sure to subscribe so you will never miss a video. So let's get started. Beep, beep. Under the bus you go. Okay, this is a tale that was related to me by a friend of mine, Bob, I took notes and got the details, but since Bob doesn't have a Reddit account, I got his permission to post it here. Bob has read this and verified it. Bob was a backup store lead hand for a retail store. Along with his colleague Larry, he made sure that shipments and deliveries were scheduled and handled correctly, that the crew out back were doing their jobs, and that the restocks for front of store were picked correctly. His assistant manager, A.M. Frank, had resigned, and Bob had applied for the job. Bob had been handling many of the Frank's duties, particularly those that involved computers, since Frank was older and not very adept with a keyboard and mouse. Bob didn't get the job. Instead they brought in Richard, an A.M. from another store, and Bob had worked with him in the past. He was a jerk and had once thrown Bob under the bus for one of his own mistakes, causing Bob to get yelled at on the floor in front of his colleagues, then hauled into the manager's office to get written up. Bob was thinking of quitting anyway, but getting turned down for the AM position, and then seeing Richard roll in, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. One thing that pertinent is that Larry, his colleague, was a Harley-riding biker type. He wasn't a member of a club, but enjoyed riding, and did charity rides and stuff like that. He also, every year for a decade, went to Sturgis, South Dakota, for the annual rally in August. So Bob decided to submit his resignation, effective the day after Larry left for his trip. He did this by attaching a PDF of his resignation to a bunch of reports, and requested a read receipt. Bingo! Richard clicked read and Bob printed it out. The schedule for the warehouse crew was posted online, on a web-based scheduling app, with the admin account under assistant manager, at, store.com, this was store policy. All emails were created as job title, at, and when a person left the position, the password was changed. This way, nobody had to change their contact information, they were communicating with the job title, and not the individual. IT had a list of logins for every position and changed passwords with every transition, so the outgoing person couldn't sabotage things. Bob had asked Richard repeatedly for his password to the scheduling site and never got an answer. So, Larry worked a Thursday and headed out. Bob worked Friday, his last day, and before he left, he told his crew to make certain they checked the scheduling app and worked their scheduled hours. Then he went home and shut off his work phone. On the Monday, before opening, he showed up to turn in his phone and his keys to be greeted by Richard losing his SH asterisk T. The store manager corralled both of them and took them to his office. Richard went on a tear, describing the SH asterisk T show that happened over the weekend, how Bob was incommunicado, Richard had to come in and piss on fires and demanded that Bob be written up. Bob let him go on and on. The store manager said, Bob, what have you got to say about this? Well, a write-up is a disciplinary action for an employee, right? Yes. It's going to be hard to make that stick, since I'm not an employee. Bob had a folder and pulled out a printed copy of his resignation, showing that the previous Friday was his last day. The store manager read it, then handed it to Richard. Richard said, you never sent this to me. Yes I did, three weeks ago. Here's a copy of the email, and here's a copy of the read receipt. The store manager gave Richard a wilting stare. So who have you got lined up to replace Bob? Have you been interviewing? I didn't get this email. This is fake. No, I haven't been interviewing anyone. I guess Larry will have to cover until I can fill that position. Bob, yeah, good luck with that, Larry isn't even in this time zone. He's in Sturgis. 
And no, it's not fake. If you want, IT can verify that by checking your email history. Richard turned white. He realized he had no supervisors for the doc at all. The store manager asked Bob, is there any way we can get you to stick around? No, thanks. I've already lined up a new job, sorry. But you've got bigger problems than this. SM, like what? Bob pulled out more copies of emails and handed them over. I asked Richard repeatedly for his password to the scheduling app. Several times. Can I jump on your computer for a second? SM turned his laptop to face Bob, and Bob logged into the scheduling app. Okay, so the admin account is under Richard's job title. This is where we post the schedule for the crew. I used to do it for Frank because he wasn't a computer guy, but technically, this falls under the assistant manager role, the login is assistant manager, at. I'm logged in under my own account, but I can still see who's scheduled across the board. I just can't edit it. I don't have the permissions. Here's the schedule for the warehouse crew for the next two weeks. He turned the laptop back around. It's blank. There isn't anyone scheduled to work at all. Bob turned to Richard. Here's my keys and here's my company phone. I'm done. By the way, in accordance with this email from IT, I factory reset the phone. Good luck. Bob left the office and all the way out of the store, he could hear the manager yelling at Richard. Apparently, Richard had to go into the personnel file and burn up the phone lines calling warehouse guys to come in at the last minute, and company policy was that if you were called in with less than 24 hours notice, it was time and a half. Many of the records were outdated, so if he reached a worker he had to ask them if he had any of their co-workers' numbers. Once he got things straightened out a bit he was shown the door, they brought a lead hand and an assistant manager in from another store. Richard was fired for cause, denying him unemployment and tagged with a do not rehire. Justice finally served on toxic former employers. Okay, I know this is long but I hope it's a fun read. I do have to be careful because two of these people have rather high profiles on the internet and one is an actual celebrity. I didn't include as many details as I would have liked because they could be easily identified. So, on with what I hope are the juicy details. Over 10 years ago I worked for a company owned by a married couple whom we will refer to as the McGrifties. Mrs. told her first lie to me during the job interview, not the last though. She mentioned an employee who would be going on maternity leave and said that we knew she was pregnant when we hired her. I later heard from the pregnant employee herself, just in passing, that she didn't know she was pregnant when she started working there. Just a stupid lie so they could look like nicer people than they were. The employee turnover was insane. They were micromanagers who treated their employees horribly. One guy submitted his two-week notice the week before we had a two-day holiday, and they make it effective immediately, thus screwing him out of pay for those days. Going to the bathroom? Be sure to log that in time since they need to know you spent every minute. Their employee reviews mention words like toxic, terrible, and wish I could forget I worked there. We once had some overflow work, and they had me find someone to handle it. Literally the first person I called turned me down flat. She had already done work for them, and had to take them to court to get paid, and still didn't recover all she was owed. I had complained to a few co-workers regarding an ongoing issue with our 401k contributions to our accounts along with a few other issues, it got back to management and I was fired. I was a good employee but was tired of being treated not just poorly but with great suspicion. They assumed everyone was out to screw them which will tell you something about their own approach to other people. At that point I didn't care but when they got my unemployment denied because someone sent me an email that really pissed me off. Yeah it was a bullsh asterisk t decision by the commission, but they bought that crap anyway. The woman at the commission actually asked me in the snottiest voice just how did that person, a former employee, knew my email. Yeah, lady he used to work there, he knew everyone's. FFS. Here's some petty revenge to tide you over. 
Not terribly long after that one of my former co-workers sent me a copy of Mrs. Mugshot. Apparently, she had been pulled over for a traffic violation, things went sideways, and she was arrested. I wasn't a bit surprised because she was always an entitled B asterisk TCH who thought rules didn't apply to her. Over the next few days I went to a several different places with fax services and sent her mug shot to the company's fax number. I also went by at night to tape some up around their office building. So here we are many years later, and about a year ago, I am reading some gossip column about celebrities and see a familiar name. One of the McGrifty's offspring has become engaged to a celebrity worth double-digit millions, money bags and B. Of course, my curiosity was sparked so I thought I would see if they were even in business any longer. I turn to my friend Google and find they are, defying all logic and justice, indeed still in business. However, I also discovered the delightful news that Mr. was in the middle of an active bankruptcy. I could only see docket entries, which include a motion for emergency sale of their homestead. Wondering if they had managed to sell their million-dollar-plus home, I popped over the county assessor's website and looked up their address. They still showed as owners, but when I checked ownership history I saw that title has been transferred a few months before. Okay so they did sell the house to an LLC. Hum, interesting. I am on alert. I decide to look a little closer at MB and find their IG account. Well, well, what a no, the IG name is almost the same name that took title to the McGrifty's house. Now, I am very interested and I really need to know what the house sold for. I am suspicious by nature and I know these people. Besides smelling a rat, I also smell an opportunity to drop some karma on their ass. I do a little more digging and finally hit gold with a 72-page document that includes every lien and judgment against them, and there are lots. They have judgments against them from two different banks, one for around 2 million and another over half a million. Their house went into foreclosure some months back, and they owed 400k more than the property was worth. I also found a notice from the state commission that they own employee 3k. The sweetest though is that they have close to $2 million in IRS tax liens against them. All told, they were close to $4 million in debt. I was overjoyed. The best part however was the much desired and lovely copy of the sales contract, which shows the sales price is more than 500 k below the appraised value. The motion also states that Mr. says this is a good sales price. Yeah, for the buyer, his future triple X in law. Mr. doesn't care since he isn't getting a nickel of the money, it's all going to the mortgage company who agreed to settle for the sales price. Now, I'm no bankruptcy attorney, but this looks shady as hell to me, and as a tax-paying US citizen I feel compelled to report what I believe might be fraud. I copied the tax rolls showing properties in that area rarely sell for under a million, and their property was valued at over $1.3 million. I also included a screenshot of MB's IG page announcing the engagement and showing the IG name was pretty much the same as the purchaser. One last thing I found was a little blurb along with their picture in the Rich Neighborhood Happenings publication mentioning the McGrifties hosted an intimate get-together for 30 at some nightclub around the holidays, after Mr. filed for bankruptcy, and all while asking the court to discharge millions upon millions in debt. Just for fun I took a screenshot of that too. I sent copies of all to the bankruptcy judge, bankruptcy trustee, and lawyers for the mortgage company along with nice cover letter pointing out a few other inconsistencies. Then I sit back and wait. After a bit of thought, I decide the information I have is too special not to be should be shared with others. Now, Mrs. considers herself a mover and a shaker in the higher echelons of the business world when in truth she's just a pretentious wannabe and a broke as one at that. I must give her credit though, she has a large internet presence and had promoted herself quite effectively. A lot of that is based on something she did a while back that brought her a lot of attention at the time and she played it up to the hilt. Funny thing though, I believe that very same accomplishment is what started the downward financial spiral since it was a very expensive endeavor that doesn't seem to have paid off as they had hoped. Several websites list the company's revenue at 5-10 m a year, but it's a lie.
Less than two years ago the company had a total of $391.37 in the only corporate bank account, gotta love those bankruptcy records. That kind of blatant BS really cheeses me off so I sent copies of all the judgments and highlighted the part where Mrs. said they were broke and drowning in debt to the chair of some Ivy League college women's board that she belongs to and pays 20k a year to be a member. I also sent copies to someone in politics with whom Mrs. had curried AS asterisk CK up relationship for years. I'll eventually get around to sending something to DNB so they can make a correction. After about a week, I checked the docket sheet and just about fell out of my chair laughing. There, on the bankruptcy court docket sheet, was response to order filed by Avenging B asterisk TCH, not really but you get the picture. Although I was highly amused, I was also a bit freaked out because I really didn't expect it to become part of the public record. However, I did expect there to be some sort of blowback. By now you can guess what happened and why we find ourselves instead of nuclear. Nada, nothing. Bankruptcy proceeded as usual and the debts were eventually discharged. My bomb failed to launch. I am left with disappointment and future regret, not really, I just love that line from the coin commercial. The saga is not entirely over though. They are currently being sued for non-payment of rent by a past landlord, their second time for this sort of thing. The first time they stopped paying rent they were locked out of the premises, but according to court docs picked the lock and moved their possessions out in the middle of the night. Landlord sued and was granted a 45k judgment against them that they actually paid. They eventually quit paying rent to the new landlords, and that is the case still in court. Since they broke their lease they could be on the hook for around 400k. Concerned for their current landlord, I made sure to send them evidence of their tenants' propensity for stiffing their landlords and warned them not to let them get too fast past due. While looking over the filings of their current court case, I discovered a few inconsistencies. For example, Mrs. wrote in an email to the landlord that she was working to settle her debt with the IRS, and that had to be a priority. Hum, the debt that was dismissed in bankruptcy? She also claimed that they had employees that had been there since the company started, which is true, Mr. and Mrs. McGrifties. I am 99% sure they are the only ones. I shared that information with the plaintiff's attorney and suggested they were being rather disingenuous, such a lovely word for liar. Oh, and that document, too, became part of the public record. I do take great satisfaction in knowing that they are now aware that someone keeping track of their misfortunes and actively seeking to make them worse. Oh goodness, that reminds me. Shortly after I discovered all this information, I sent them a condolence card telling them I had heard of their tax liens and judgments, and it couldn't have happened to two more deserving people, signed it Karma. As for me, great things happened after I left the McGrifties. I did get my unemployment. Took a job that ended when my new boss resigned, but it was just long enough to qualify. Pretty sure the McGrifties ended up being on the hook for most of it after all. I then went to work for a wonderful guy who paid for me to go back to college, finish my bachelor's, and get a master's degree. As an undergrad, I co-wrote two papers with an awesome professor that were published in peer-reviewed journals. I saved a nice sum of money, own a lake house and look forward to retiring in a few years, and enjoying myself, all while the McGrifties basically have nothing. The offspring did marry MB recently, so I guess they'll have the hope that some of that money will migrate over to them, or they can get MB to invest in their failure of a company. Let's hope there's a prenup. Thanks for hanging in there and hope you found it worth the read.